Well, I want to welcome you to our service today. And as we begin to prepare our hearts for worship, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a beautiful morning. We thank you for giving us a wonderful week. We thank you, Father, that you answer our prayers, that you hear us when we pray. And Lord, we pray now as we come before you that you prepare our hearts as we worship together, as we share in these songs, Lord, as we sing from our heart, and Lord, as we study the word of God together. May you get all the glory today. May your name be honored and worshiped. Lord, may you draw us to yourself. I pray also, Father, for someone watching that maybe they've stumbled across this website. Maybe they stumbled across this stream and that today is the day of salvation. Today you're drawing them to yourself. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would convince their hearts of the truth of the word of God and that Jesus Christ is Lord. We pray for their salvation. We pray that you would open their minds and their hearts even now and grant them repentance. Thank you for what you're going to do in this time that we have together. Again, may you be honored, may you be worshipped, and may you be glorified. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came.
in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are you garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are you garments spotless are they white as So my soul longeth after thee You alone are my heart's desire And I long to worship thee You alone are my strength, my shield To you alone may my spirit yield desire and I long to worship thee. You're my friend and you are my brother even though you are a king. I love you more than any other, so much more than any silver only you can satisfy you alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye you reading is taken from 1 John chapter 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Yesterday, today Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today And forever, Hebrews 13, 8 And forever, Hebrews 13, 8 And forever, Hebrews 13, Same yesterday and today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today. And forever, Hebrews 13, 8. And forever, Hebrews 13, 8. And forever, Hebrews 13, 8. It doesn't take very long to realize that we may be at the end of everything. In fact, the question we can ask this morning as we study the Word of God together, is this the end? Have we approached the end of the world? And for many churches, we're hoping an amen where we can have the Lord Jesus Christ come and reign on His throne and a lot of biblical prophecy be fulfilled. Of course, in light of our loved ones who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not ready for Him to come back yet. We want them to be saved. But the question is, with what's going on with this coronavirus and what has changed in our world and how nations are coming together and working with one another, how we're seeing shutdowns of businesses and we're told uh, of citizens to stay home, don't go out, don't go anywhere. Are we at the end? Now, there is an article that... A friend passed on to me. It's found at crosswalk.com. And the title is this, is Coronavirus Ushering in the Antichrist's One World Government. It's written by Dr. Roger Barrier. Now, we know that there has been a talk of a one world government for some time now. But in recent weeks, with this coronavirus, we've been hearing it even more. We've been hearing about a one world government. We've been hearing about a cashless society. We have been hearing about global vaccines and the first time in probably any time where all the nations of the world are coming together and working with one another. But again, the question is, are we there? And in this article that there is a statement I'd like to read to you that I believe is very factual. And he says this, the truth is our world may actually be getting ready for a one world government. The pieces are being put in place Today, I would agree with that. We have been for some time getting ready for the return or for the rise, I should say, not return, but the rise of the Antichrist. Who is this Antichrist? Well, the Bible mentions the Antichrist and it mentions him by telling us that he will be a very powerful figure. In the book of Daniel, he is referred to in Daniel 8 as the horned goat. In the book of Revelation, like chapter 13, verse 1, and chapter 17, verses 8 to 24, he's called the beast. But he will be the one who will be successful in setting up a one world government. And signs of this do point to it. There's been a call for a new world order, and that goes all the way dating back to 1935, where that has been tried and sought after. 
the Antichrist will actually be the one who will unify the ten nations. And many believe that this coronavirus is fulfilling much of the prediction. Technology tracks everyone, mass financial changes, fraud is rampant, economic sanctions, common worldwide currency. And of course we live in a time that in the last 70 years it's been possible for everyone to see Jesus simultaneously at his second coming. And of course we anticipate that as believers that Jesus Christ is going to return. But let's take some time and look at the Bible. Let's look and see what the scripture says about the return of Christ. So let me have you to take your Bible this morning and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now in chapter 1, if you gave a one word title for it, we would say that it would be the word comfort. You go to chapter 2, we'd have to say the word would be correction because that's what we're finding in chapter 2. Paul has to correct uh, much misunderstanding about prophetic events that we find there. It's here where Paul actually exhorts the Thessalonians to stand fast in the faith, to not be alarmed at the rumors they heard concerning the sudden coming of Christ, because previously to this coming, there would be a great apostasy from the true faith and a manifestation of a son of perdition. The subject of of the second coming of Christ and the day of the Lord encompasses the first 12 verses. And though we will not have time to look at all 12 verses this morning, I would like to read them so that we have them in our hearing. So if you have your Bibles, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I want to begin reading at verse 1. Paul says, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. As we look at this second chapter, it's important to know that this is Paul's fifth mention of Christ's coming. He mentions it four times in his first letter in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, chapter 3, verse 13 chapter 4, verse 15, and chapter 5, verse 23. And now, in chapter 2, verse 1 of this second letter, he mentions it again. This is the parousia that occurs 24 times in the New Testament. And that word coming, or parousia, it means presence, or arrival, or coming. The word is used in the New Testament to speak of the coming of human beings. It's used of the coming of Jesus at the end of the age, and it's used of the coming of the Antichrist. Of the 17 times the word coming is used in connection with the return of Christ. It's used only in the singular and always with the definite article or a personal pronoun. That is, the coming, or your coming, or his coming. Not once does the Bible speak of two comings. There's not even a hint or an implication of two comings. 
Marvin Rosenthal says, the Lord's coming is a comprehensive whole. There is only one second coming. It includes the rapture of the church, the outpouring of God's wrath during the day of the Lord, and Christ's physical return in glory. The meaning of the word coming or parousia demonstrates that fact. It means a coming and continuing presence. The Lord's coming is cons consistently portrayed as a singular event. The Bible is repetitively consistent on that fact. Matthew 24, 3 and says, And what shall be the sign of your coming? Verse 27 says, So shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. 2 Thessalonians 2, 19, In the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming. 1 Thessalonians 3, 13, The coming of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15, we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2.1 Now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this occurs over and over and over as we find in Paul's writings. In each and every instance, the word coming or parousia is either modified by the personal pronoun his or thy or most frequently with the definite article thee. And in every case, his return is in the singular. He's not talking about comings. You didn't hear any time in any of those verses I read, comings, plural. No, you read the singular, or you heard the singular, coming. There's not even a hint anywhere of two separate comings. The often heard suggestion that Christ will come first for his church, and then return to the earth a second time seven years later with his church, that's an assumption with no biblical evidence to substantiate it. And as we look at 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, as we Look here at the parousia, speaking of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible makes it extremely clear that Jesus will return for his own. In John 14, verses 1 to 3, Jesus told his disciples, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, and if it were not so, I would have told you. For I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. There's the promise that Jesus gave to his disciples, that he would come back for his own. Paul referred to the coming of Christ in his first letter, in chapter 4, in verses 16 and 17, where he says this, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. So this gathering together to him that is mentioned, he's talking about this in First Thessalonians as well as in Second. Thessalonians. But I want you to notice the Thessalonians alarm. Paul says that they were quickly shaken by the news that they had heard concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ there in verse 2. And the day of the Lord as if it had come. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 you have the rapture of the saints that occurs first and then if you follow chronological order you see then the day of the Lord occurs and so we're seeing this as two events. That would line up with Matthew 24 as well as Revelation chapter 6 through 8 with the seals, the trumpet, and the bowl judgments. Paul gives this same sequence in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 when he refers to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him and the day of the Lord. But you have to look at Revelation chapter 6 and Matthew 24 to understand at what point the man of sin is revealed and the saints are raptured. Now, there are four views of the rapture. 
There is the pre-tribulational view. There is the mid-tribulational view. There is the post-tribulational view and the pre-wrath view. The view that we have been teaching for some time is that fourth view, the pre-wrath rapture, which basically says that the church will go through the first seals of Revelation chapter 6 and then be raptured before the seventh seal, which is the day of the Lord's wrath. Again, it's how you look at this period in the pre-tribulational rapture, which is a common view for many, many churches. It looks at the entire 70 weeks of Daniel, that entire seven years as tribulation. But Matthew 24 doesn't refer to that entire period as tribulation. It refers to the first three and a half years as the beginning of birth pains, and then the last three and a half years as the great tribulation. It doesn't call that entire period tribulation. First three and a half years are marked by a false peace that the Antichrist sets up and secures with the nation of Israel. Therefore, of course, it occurs across the entire earth. So Paul begins the first two verses referencing the two events and then addresses their alarm and finally corrects their error by reminding them of what he taught them when he was still with them. So the subject matter of this chapter focuses on whether the gathering of the saints and the day of the Lord has come. And if you think about it, that would be alarming. Many have been alarmed over this coronavirus. But listen, if Jesus had already come or the day of the Lord has already started, that would create more or even a worse panic. Because there are a lot of people that believe that they have plenty of time to get right with God. And the fact is that you're living on borrowed time. If you don't give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ today, you have no promise of the next five minutes or the next minute or 30 seconds. You don't have the promise of tomorrow. And if we are living in uncertain times, and these times are going to grow worse. In fact, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about a deluding influence being sent so that you would believe a lie. It is imperative. It is imperative that you believe in Christ now. Right now. It will be much harder later. But you'll notice there, in his first letter, he had to calm their sorrow. Remember when he wrote that in chapter 4 and verses 13 through 18? He had to correct their understanding of the coming of Christ. And at that point, they thought that there was some advantage to being raptured over dying and immediately being with Christ. So he says in verse 13, We do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. In other words, stop sobbing like the world. He doesn't mean that they are not to mourn for their loved ones who had died, but they should not act like the world in their sorrow, acting as do the rest who have no hope. Believers have hope. Death for the Christian is not the end. It's actually the beginning. Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8 that he preferred to be absent from the body and to be present with Christ. Why? Because he would immediately be with the Lord. You remember the thief on the cross? When he asked Jesus, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. It was immediate. That's why Paul could say in Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why is death gain to Paul? Well, he answers that question in verse 23 by saying, I'm hard pressed from both having the desire to to depart and to be with Christ, for that is very much better. That's why it's gain. Because immediately you are in the presence of Christ. Immediately you are with Jesus. And that is far, far greater. Now, if you look at verse 2 as to the day of the Lord, if you recall, chapter 1 defined it as the day of the wrath of the Lord. That's what Ezekiel 7.19 and Zephaniah 1.8 refers to it as. Joel 1.15 refers to the day of the Lord as destruction from the Almighty. Uh, Joel chapter 2, the first two verses, describes it as a horrible day. Let me read those verses to you. It says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm on my holy mountain." Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. 
Surely it is near a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after, after it to the years of many generations. So it describes the day of the Lord, first of all, as coming. Secondly, as a day of darkness, a day of gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. So when Paul begins chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, he begins by stating that this day hadn't occurred yet, nor has Jesus come for his saints. So he says, therefore, do not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed. And those terms quickly shaken, they've been used to describe an earthquake in Acts 16.26. Acts 16, quickly carries the idea of something fast, something at once, something without delay. Shaken means to be distressed or unsettled. And so it signifies to be moved as a wave of the sea or to be tossed up like the waves or as a vessel is to tossed up. And if you take the word disturb, it describes a state of agitation, a state of alarm. And that had gripped the church. They were greatly distressed because they had expected the rapture, the gathering together to the Lord, to take place before the day of the Lord. They had expected to be taken to glory and heavenly rest, not left to persecution, not left to divine wrath. And so Paul must have, if we look back to the first letter, chapter 5, he must have taught them that they would miss the day of the Lord but they had become confused because of the persecution that they were experiencing. And they were thinking that they were in the day of the Lord. Just like many today could be confused and thinking that we are at the end right now. You know, we've always taught, and we've always seen it taught in Scripture that Jesus could come right now. That you need to be ready. But if you read Matthew 24, it's not a signless event. Look at Matthew 24 and look at the signs that Jesus mentions. Compare that to Revelation chapter 6 with the opening of the seals. Of course, many today have, again, caught into an error of believing that the day of the Lord has already come, that Jesus Christ has already come. That hasn't been taught for centuries. Paul gives us the source of this error in verse 2 as being either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us. A spirit would most likely refer to a false prophet who had claimed divine revelation as you would read in 1 John 4, 1 to 3. A word would refer to a sermon or would refer to a speech given while a letter would indicate a written report. The powerful but alarming effect of this false information was gained by claiming it was from the Apostle Paul. He says, as if from us. So whoever was telling them that they were in the day of the Lord claimed that it had came from Paul who heard it, preached it, wrote it. So their lie was given supposed apostolic sanction. And so the result was shock and fear and alarm. And now if you look down at verse 3 and all the way to verse 12, Paul corrects the error that had pervaded the Thessalonians. But let's just look at this. There are three events that must occur before Jesus returns. That's why I said it's not a signless event. Three events. Pay close attention to this. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 beginning at verse 3. We have two of those events mentioned in verse 3. Listen to what he says. Let no one in any way deceive you. For it will not come, you get this, unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition. He says that first there is a worldwide falling away that is referred to as the apostasy. And the second he thing he mentions is the man of lawlessness being revealed. That is the Antichrist. The third event is mentioned in verses 6 and 7, and that is the removal of the restrainer. So when these three events happen, the day of the Lord is here. Look at verse 8. 
Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Beloved, any time false information is given, it has the potential to deceive someone. And that's certainly what took place here. So Paul corrects that deception with giving the events leading up to the day of the Lord. First, look at verse 3. He talks about the apostasy. That word means defection. That means abandonment. That's referring to a rebellion. This is a whole-scale abandonment of Christianity or the gospel. Paul warned about this when he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.1. He says, But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 10, At that time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Let me ask you this simple question. Is there been a worldwide falling away from the faith, the gospel, from Christianity? Not yet. This is basically seal number 5 in Revelation 6 verses 9 through 11 where there will also be the death of martyrs for the Lord Jesus. Linsky says the fact that this apostasy will occur in the Christian church is beyond question. It would otherwise not be an apostasy. The man of lawlessness will be its head. John MacArthur adds, stating that this is an event which is clearly and specifically identifiable and unique, the consummate act of rebellion, an event of final magnitude. The key to identifying the event is to identify the main person, which Paul does, calling him the man of sin. So again, has this occurred yet? Has this happened with the coronavirus? No. Are we getting ready for this? Well, I believe the world is getting ready for the rise of the Antichrist. In fact, I've said this many times, you've heard me say this, that things in the world have to get really bad before they get better. And then when they get better, it's only going to be temporary. It's going to be a false peace. The second event that occurs before the day of the Lord is the revealing of the man of lawlessness. Who is this man of lawlessness? Who is this son of destruction that will be revealed before the day of the Lord. Well, Scripture refers to him by many names. Daniel 7, 8 calls him the little horn. Daniel eleven thirty six 36 calls him the willful king. He's called here in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, the man of sin or the man of lawlessness. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, he's also called the son of perdition or the son of destruction. In verse 8, he's called the wicked one or the lawless one. Revelation 11, verse 7, he's called the beast First John 4, 3, he's called the Antichrist. In fact, the Bible gives us 21 facts about the coming of the Antichrist. Listen to what some of these are. He will be an intellectual genius, according to Daniel 8, 23. He will be an oratorial genius, according to Daniel eleven thirty six. He will be a political genius, Revelation 17, 11, and 12. He will be a commercial genius, Daniel 11.43. He will be a military genius, Revelation 6.2. He will be a religious genius, 2 Thessalonians 2.4. He will begin by controlling the western power block, according to Revelation 17.12. He'll make a seven-year covenant with Israel, but he will break it after three and a half years, that's Daniel 9.27. He will attempt to destroy all of Israel. That's Revelation chapter 12. He will destroy the false religious systems so that he may rule unhindered. That's Revelation 17 verses 16 and 17. He will set himself up as God. That's Daniel eleven thirty six and 37. Also 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. He will briefly rule over all nations. Yes, America would be included in that. That's Psalm 2, Daniel eleven thirty six, and Revelation thirteen sixteen. He will be utterly crushed by the Lord Jesus Christ at the battle of Armageddon. That's Revelation chapter 19. 
He will be the first creature thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 19.20. According to 2 Thessalonians 2.10. He will be a master of deceit. Matthew 24.15 tells us he will profane the temple. Revelation 13.2 tells us he will be energized by Satan himself. Daniel 11.36 tells us he will do everything according to his own selfish will. Daniel 11.37 tells us he will not regard the God of his fathers. Daniel 11.37 also tells us he will not have the desire of women. Does that mean he'll be a homosexual? I'm not really sure. Daniel 11.38 says his God will be the God of power. So this is the man of lawlessness. This is the son of destruction that has to be revealed before the day of the Lord's wrath occurs. So Paul says he has not been revealed yet. So stop being alarmed as if Jesus had already come and the day of the Lord is already occurring. Now if you read the book of Revelation, the first chapter of course reveals to us Jesus Christ in all of his glory as John sees a glorified vision of Jesus. Then he's told to write the book, the book of Revelation, to record the events that are there. And then chapters 2 and 3, we have the seven churches. And you study the seven churches and you'll find out that they are characteristic of every church of every age. There are different types of churches that represent different types of churches today. And then, of course, chapter 4, we have being called up to heaven. We see the description of the throne of God. We see the worship that's taking place there. Chapter 5, we see the opening up of the seals. Chapter 6, you have the seals. Chapter 7, you have the final seal, the seventh seal. You have there, which is called the day of the Lord. And then out of that come the trumpet and the bold judgments. All of these things are future events. Now, there were literal seven churches that are mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3. These are literal churches that did exist. And just about all of them went out of existence. They do not exist today. But like I said, they are emblematic of churches today. They describe to us what churches are like. What manifestation that they give. My fear, as you listen to this, is that people not necessarily are alarmed because of the events with the coronavirus, or even thinking that Jesus has already come, or that we're experiencing the day of the Lord right now. I don't think that really that's what's going on. I think if anything, people just don't care. They want to get back to their lives. They want to get back to doing whatever they were doing before all this happened. And in many cases, this is the state of the church. Believers are not looking for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, they're not evangelizing. They're not talking to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, during this event, this is a wonderful opportunity to talk about Jesus and his return. And to talk about a more deadly virus, not the coronavirus. Talk about the the virus of sin. And how it has plagued all of mankind. And every person coming into the world is in sin. And even in Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 1, it talks about being dead in trespasses and sins. And that every person must be forgiven of their sin in order to go to heaven. I don't believe that the church is warning unbelievers of a coming wrath. We're just sitting around and we're enjoying our social clubs. We have our buildings. We have our phones. We have our social media. There is a restrainer to all this mess that's in the world. And most importantly, there is a restrainer to the man of sin that is yet to be revealed. And I believe that the church needs to be ready. We need to stop banking on the view of which view of the rapture is correct. Now you notice I've given you four views and I took the last view, the pre-wrath rapture. And again, it goes back to how you look at the 70 weeks. How does the scripture look at this? Which view best fits the scripture? And you know, I could be wrong. In fact, we all could be wrong. But what we're not wrong about, Jesus is coming. He is coming. Scripture says that. 
Now, when, we don't know. And we can't run around making predictions as to when he's coming back because we do not know. And there have been many people who have made those predictions and have been proven false. But we need to be ready for his return. We need to be doing the work of the Lord. We need to be living godly lives. If you're doing all that, you're ready for his return. And as I said, there is a restrainer. The restrainer is the Spirit of God who restrains sin. He is the restrainer of the man of sin. But again, we need to be ready. We need to be ready. And if the view that I have given of the pre-wrath rapture is correct, the church isn't ready to suffer. Are you ready to suffer for your faith? Oh, there are many people that don't even talk about their faith. And of course, we have to question whether they really do have true faith in Jesus. Because if you're denying him before men, he will deny you before the Father. So we need to talk about Jesus. We need to tell people about the cross and about the resurrection of Christ. And that Jesus died on the cross for yours and my sin. For their sin. And he rose on the third day. And that if you confess him as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But you have to depart from your sin. You have to let go of your sin if you want Christ. You have to make that exchange. You exchange your life, your rotten, sinful, wicked life, for the righteous life of Jesus. Which means, Luke 9, 23, you deny yourself, you take up your cross, and you follow Him. We need to pray for the state of the church. We need to pray for the state of all believers. Look at this time. Look at what's going on in our world. If anything we see, we can see how things change very quickly. And how quick government is to take control of everything. I mean, we're hearing about governors in different states that have put some strict guidelines on the citizens that live in those states. Some are being arrested for going out in their backyard. There was one arrested who went to the beach. He got on his surfboard and went out to surf. He was circled by police boats. When he finally got out of the water, they arrested him. You know what? He was the only person on that beach besides the police. He had social distancing going on. There was nobody else there. That's why I said earlier to open up the beaches here in Florida... For three hours, how can you practice social distancing when everybody's ready to get out of their house and run to the beach? You'd be better off to, to have opened it up for the entire day and then people can come and go and it would create a crowd control. But we need to look at these world events, not ignore them. There is coming a one world government. There's coming a one world currency, a cashless society. There's coming a one world religion. There's coming a one world ruler who will rule all the nations. He is anti-Christ. He is against Christ. But at one point, he will say he is Christ. He will literally say that he is God. Now, beloved, you want to wait around for that time? I don't. I wouldn't. You want to wait on believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and being saved? 2 Thessalonians, as I said earlier, mentions that there will be a strong delusion sent so that you would believe a lie. So my advice to you is to repent and give your life to Jesus right now. So let's look at the events of Scripture. We'll come back to this next week. Let's make sure we're correct in our, our prophetic understanding of Scripture. Jesus is coming. He hasn't come yet. The day of the Lord hasn't happened yet. Are we in the end times? Yes, we are in the end times. We may be at the end of the end. But there are things that have to happen. There has to be a worldwide falling away from the faith. Those who have professed Jesus as Lord and Savior. Those who attend church. Those who say they're Christians. There has to be a worldwide falling away. And then there has to be a revealing of the son of perdition. The revealing of the Antichrist. Those two things have not occurred yet. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this time to study it together. 
Help us to be salt and light in this world. Help us to share the, the message of the gospel with those who hear us, those who we're around, those in our family. Let's make sure that our family knows Jesus. And when we go out into the world, we go out into the marketplace, we go to the grocery store, we go to places where we need to pick up items, let's take advantage of the opportunity that we have to talk about you and invite people to examine their lives to as to whether they truly are saved. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for this day together, this time together. We worship you. We thank you that you are on your throne, that you are in control of everything. You are a sovereign master, your sovereign God. And we praise you, Lord, for all these things that we've looked at today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I surely fail. Without him I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? You can't turn him away. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, without him how lost I would be. Without him I would be dying. Without him I'd be enslaved. Without him life would be hopeless. But with Jesus, thank God I'm saved. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? You can turn him away. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Without him, how lost I would be. Without him, how lost I would be.